This is Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Subscribe for new content notifications. Now, here's Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to Digital Perspectives, everybody. I'm Brad Kimes, and I think you know who the guy sitting beside me is. This is Dave Cryptopolis in the house. Dave, how are you this morning? Doing great, Brad. Hope you're doing well. I am. XRP's 30 cents and strong. I'm, I'm really nice. happy. Yeah, me too. We got a lot to talk about this morning. For one, <laughs> XRP's 30 cents, and not too long ago, it was 17 cents. Can we talk about that for a second to open the floor up here? Absolutely. You know, we had a nice little run here. Uh, we talked about it last week that, you know, institutions are probably coming into the market. We've got a, we got a nice, you know, hey, we've been talking for a long time about the fact that when you least expect it, we're going to go up. And we did. Here we are almost doubled from the from the 17 cent price that we were at just a week and a half ago. Absolutely. Well said. And to your point about institutions getting ready to come into this space. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, my. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to share the screen so they can see. You may not be able to see at home, Dave, but I'm going to share this here so they can all see exactly what we're talking about. Barry Silbert from Grayscale Investment Group has put out a tweet this morning that really kind of just sends it all home. And let me see if I can get this open. And here it is right here. If you guys can't see it, there it is. So Barry Silver says, are you ready? Grayscale's national ad campaign kicks off next week with a TV ads on CNBC, MSNBC, Fox, Fox Business. We're going to bring crypto to the masses. Now, listen, that Dave just it's. You just tell me what that's saying to you. Well, it's interesting that he 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 comes out with this now because he's made two moves over the last month that have been really kind of interesting. Uh, he has now registered. He's uh, made both of the uh, GBTC ETH uh, E uh, uh, trusts that he runs a SEC reporting trust. And so he's trying to make this as mainstream as possible. He doesn't want to be on the OTC market. He wants to be in the mainstream. And now he's coming out with this ad campaign. And you know what? He sees the writing on the wall. He right? does, doesn't he? I mean, he's watching the OCC come out with their statement a couple of weeks ago saying, hey, we've got cryptocurrency here, which is a – and the OCC said this. They want to help their customers – protect their most valuable assets and in and, and they mentioned cryptocurrencies in that sentence so you've got the OCC coming out saying it's a valuable asset and now you've got grayscale really stepping up to the plate saying hey we're going to legitimize this space by being an SEC reporting trust and now you've got this announcement they are really at the forefront very sober uh, head off to him man he's just a he's a rocker man he's he's a shaker and so he's going after this market, you know, and he's going to grab a big, big piece of it. So it's good news. It is extremely good news. I mean, you know, what, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, we discussed recently on a panel about the OCC news, uh, I think it was a week or two ago, we were sitting on a panel and it was uh, Mr. BXRP, Digital Asset Investor, and myself and some other pundits in the space and it was amazing to me because you know the announcements of the of the OCC clarifying that was also dealing with lending and it also clarified that banks can lend to crypto companies and institutions as long as they follow safe guidelines like they would with any lender and I thought that was remarkable too because not only are they custodying but you know it's hard for these startups out here to find funding and lending and things of that nature, right? I mean, it's tough to get, you know, to get started. This innovation in tech hasn't really been defined yet, Dave. Well, I, I, I just uh, from my viewpoint, the the, uh, the funding actually isn't that difficult to get uh, because the Federal Reserve is printing so much money. That, uh, <laughs> you know, there's, there are there are hedge funds and institutional investors that just have more money than they know what to do with, and they're trying to 
they're trying to inject it into any place they can get some equity. Uh, and so, I mean, and a lot of times it's very, it's competitive because, and it's funny because the, let's say they go to company A and they say, hey, look, we'd like to give you a hundred million dollars in, in exchange for some equity or 1 million or 10 million or 5 million or whatever it is. And they'll say, look, we really don't want to give up any equity. And the company says, no, I, I don't want to do it. And they say, well, okay, we'll go to your competitor and give them the money then. Mm. And that's the way it's been working in the VC space. So, How about uh, that? The money, the money is out there. It's, it's freely available. And, you know, uh, the institutions are looking for good investments. And so, but here's the, here's the thing that is really interesting about the OCC, really kind of getting into the DeFi space, because not yeah. only can they custody cryptocurrency now, Think of it, think of the crypto that you would, uh, the banks would custody. Well, that's an asset that can be collateralized. And you, I mean, it's just, and it's, you know, it brings me back again to the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve has been buying up assets mm -hmm. of all kinds. Now they talked about even, you know, getting into the junk bond market and buying up those assets. Well, they're gonna they're going to run out if they haven't already a lot of buying up a lot of assets. They're running out of stocks. They're running out of, you know, debts. They're running out of all kinds of things that they can acquire, and it is not, um, I think, too far of a stretch to say that they have dipped their toes into cryptocurrencies, especially now that banks can custody those. Think of all the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve Bank members, and all of their uh, members as well, of that, which includes just about every single bank in the United States, custodying crypto. Mm. And so why wouldn't they dip their toe into that market and start buying up those assets as well? And then using that as collateral. An asset back system, right? I mean, we're definitely Absolutely. shifting to that whole system. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. And, and to your point, I, I said that the other day in a video as well. It was like, well, I, you know, the, the OCC also oversees and regulates uh, the federal branches, right? So this clears the Federal Reserve to hold crypto. And that's Absolutely. It's remarkable. That's a remarkable well, the Federal thing. Reserve is a private corporation. That's right. There's some, there's some some oversight, but, you know, it's pretty it's pretty loose on the oversight. Right. Um, but by, con by Congress... But for the most part, they're a private corporation. As long as they can now look, they're not stupid. Mm -hmm. These guys, they know what they're doing. They are buying debt from the United States, who has guaranteed the payments on those the interest on those bonds. They can use that as collateral to lend it to anybody they want. Yeah, those member banks can go out and use that loan to buy cryptocurrency to buy any asset that can be held legally which they can now at the banks and then collateralize it as well and so in the overnight repo market or any other interbank lending market they can actually use crypto now to collateralize loans against each other if somebody's a little bit short they need some money they need some cash right away hey yeah we've got uh, you know we've got xrp you just want to you know we'll collateralize that give us 100 million so there's all kinds of things going on behind the scenes that we're not aware of, but the uh, rules regulations are there. The OCC has said they, they are. The Federal Reserve can buy any asset they want uh, and they can collateralize that as well. So the Federal Reserve can go out as well and purchase cryptocurrencies and collateralize that with their member banks. And how, I mean, it's just, it's a remarkable moment. I mean, you know, you said this the last time we got together and it's not left me, you know, that announcement and that clarity given from Brian Brooks at the OCC should become like, you know, the national crypto day. I mean, you right. you said that and I tell you, I think that's exactly right. It really should. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I mean, you know, I guess we could start a movement saying, "Hey, let's let's uh, let's make that national cryptocurrency day." Yeah, absolutely. Hashtag national cryptocurrency day, right? I mean, <laughs> that ought to make uh, everybody realize the OCC is not an obscure agency anymore. That's for sure. Um, so now, the the implication of the institutions now being able to move into this space and obviously seeing Barry Silbert really put the flag on the moon to let everybody know that's exactly what's happening. 
What does this market look like six months or a year from now to you, Dave? You know, I I see it continuing to do what it has done now for the last couple of weeks is uh, just continue to move higher. I don't see, I mean, we we could have little sell-offs like we had a few days ago, like last weekend, but it, when retail FOMO comes into the market, there's going to be institutions there to just to kind of, you know, put a tap on it just to make sure it doesn't get out of control because the last thing they want to do is pump up the prices before they have their full bags. And if institutions coming in, they're going to want to, you know, come in, buy on the dips. Almost all the dips I've seen so far in this space has been, you know, a purchase opportunity for the institutions. And we've gone kind of right back up again. So I see, like I said last week, the footprints of smart money in this market. And I think we're just going to continue to, to go higher. Like I said, they want to, I think they want to avoid the FOMO retail the retail uh, market coming in here and just kind of driving prices up against them. And so they're going to uh, make it, make sure that the market is uh, orderly, uh, just like they do in stocks and the New York Stock Exchange, they want an orderly market. And so, hey, I wouldn't mind a 1% gain a day, you know, <laughs> <laughs> instead of 100. I mean, no, let's just, let's just be real. I mean, hey, a 1% gain is, 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 is a 300% gain a year. Absolutely. Would Who would be upset about that, right? Not That's this right. guy. Yeah. No. So now to couple all of this, we've also seen uh, a couple of congressmen who have been, you know, advocates of cryptocurrency now uh, advocating for uh, clarity from the IRS. They submitted a letter here. And let me just open this up so the audience will be able to see this. And it really is not generally about crypto. It's more about uh, proof of stake, actually, and proof of stake systems. And I'm just putting this up here for them to see. And it discusses uh, the fact that the proof of stake holders that actually hold the state, you know, put it up there to support the network for security and keeping the network going. This means the network security and proof of stake does not require massive amounts of energy consumption. They use that as a uh, as a positive as opposed to Bitcoin's proof of work. I mean, Bitcoin just takes it like a scratching post. It really does in almost every area. And these new tokens often uh, known as block rewards and incentivize people to maintain the network and typically carried out through a third party service of stake serv- uh, staking service providers. These third parties work simply uh, simplify technical processes and we believe taxpayers true gains from these tokens uh, should indeed be taxed. However, it is possible a taxation of sta- staking reward as income may overstate taxpayers actual gains from participating in this new technology. So it's really about the inhibiting with the current tax structure of being taxed before you cash out. And I guess the overall here, Dave, that I'm getting from the the takeaway looks to me like it's really more about them trying to work towards what I believe will eventually be an on and off ramp taxation instead of what's happening inside of crypto which it currently is right now, which is a nightmare. Can you just talk about right. a little bit of this? Yeah. So I think they're starting, I think Congress, uh, the congressman to sign this letter are starting to look on a granular level at the taxation issue on all of these different issues, because, you know, it, when they, uh, it, when you have mass adoption of cryptocurrencies, the last thing that the government wants is not to have that clarity on the tax issue because I mean it's confusing enough now and we're still really I think in the early stages of regulating this industry and if they don't clarify you know what uh, classifies a taxable event then the and, and we get another you know 10 million or 50 million or 100 million U.S. citizens into the cryptocurrency market, it's going to be pandemonium. And also, the, you know, the IRS wants their cut, but they want to make it so that it's palatable to, you know, major investors. And so they've got to, they've got to get this clarity, um, you know, in the system 
in order for us to really kind of move forward with the adoption, which which everyone knows is coming. Yeah, well said. And they did acknowledge also that the actual gains from participating in this technology could result in reporting and compliance nightmares for taxpayers and the services alike, which is really well said because that's what it's been for all of us that have been in this space currently right now. It's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Right. So with that being said, I do want to let everybody know Clinton Donnelly tax, uh, the tax fixer, crypto tax fixer will be on this show in a couple weeks. I've already scheduled it with him. We are going to discuss some of these things with uh, Clinton Donnelly on the show. If you guys have not followed through with your taxes, please contact Clinton and begin getting that sorted out for yourself. The IRS has hefty penalties and they do not play. So make sure you do your taxes. All right. Absolutely. Yeah. So now, okay, so in other news, there was the digital dollar, the sand dollar to launch nationwide in October for the Nassau Bahamas. Now, did you see this? This is interesting. I did. That is very interesting. I think there's going to be a lot. I mean, you know, you're talking about small countries. You know, we had that with the Marshall Islands. They're coming out. And I think they find it a way to remain sovereign, but at the same time have a little bit more control over the exchange rates, you know, uh, exchanges between different countries and central banks. Uh, I think I think they're going to find it a much easier way. I mean, they see the benefits of cryptocurrency just like we have for the last three, four, five, ten years or how long, ever long you've been in it. Quick, fast payments, you know, easily transferable, uh, verifiable without uh, the need for, you know, trusting each other because you can see everything on the blockchain. And so, you know, they see the benefits of this as well. And, you know, eventually it starts, it's going to start in a small way, but everybody's going to adapt it. So I'm not surprised to see them, you know, kind of jump on board with the blockchain and cryptocurrency, uh, you know, stable coin well they said it was a stable coin right so yeah you know you know and and you got to think about well yeah of course they want it to be stable i mean if they're going to use it as a sovereign currency they want it to be somewhat stable uh i'd like to see you know i I can't remember the details on exactly how they were going to make it stable uh did they say in there uh they did not actually they they really just talked more about when it was going to come out which is like october yeah, so you know, I think I think they're probably already ready to go. They're just going to say October is probably a good timeline for us to release it. But who knows? But I think it's going to be a trend uh, among countries. We know that Cambodia Central Bank is working on a digital currency uh, for their country. Uh, we know Thailand is very very interested. We know a lot of Southeast Asian countries that are that are doing this. Uh, they seem to be you know the early adopters on a sovereign level. Uh, for these cryptocurrencies, you know, and eventually, you know, the United States is, is going to do it as well. So I mean, once the United States does it, everybody's going to do it. And, and isn't what we're seeing kind of indicative of the regions themselves, like the, you know, the the South uh, Southeast Asian region or the Asian region in general has a lot of cross currency action happening. There's Absolutely. a lot of in, in Bahamas, a lot of tourist spots there, a lot of people rolling through that area. You have a lot of different currencies coming through these these particular regions and those are the places that i would expect to see this begin to birth itself first but then there's china and china's been pushing this whole you know digital yuan we're out here we're leading the pack we're doing this thing and that has a much different implication than what we're talking about here with china you know everybody's worried that china's going to get out in front of this thing like they have been doing and then make a run to either have more weight in the SDR basket at some point or to out and out replace the U.S. dollars, the global reserve currency. I don't think that happens. What are your thoughts on that at all? Well, we also just heard about Russia uh, passing a cryptocurrency law stating that it was legal, not legal for payments, but legal to hold and, 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 and own. 
And so that's not far away from, because they all want to get away from the petrol dollar, right? Mm -hmm. They all want to get away from the dominance of the U.S. dollar uh, as the world reserve currency. And so they're trying to develop their own system so they can transact. So Russia can transact with China. China can transact with the Middle East and, you know, and everybody else that they want to without, you know, really having to get the approval of the uh, going into U.S. dollars in order to make those transactions. So. I think that there, you know, the, the U.S. has got to see the writing on the wall on that, and they're got, they've got to come up and step up and say, "Hey, look, we've got a digital dollar now, and it's still the world reserve currency." Yeah, I don't see that changing at all. No. However, let's talk about something for a second because it all points to what's happening behind the scenes with the economy because of the liquidity crisis you and I have been reporting on for over a year and then the health crisis on top of it, which has obviously exacerbated the whole entire situation. But we've seen $7 trillion plus printed by the Fed. I just did a video the other day where the money's going straight over to the market so I had somebody, they come through the stream and they're like, yeah, what about all the doom and gloom when negative oil happened, right? For the first time in the history of oil. And I was like, oh, so you think we're out of the, we're out of the, uh, we're out of trouble now, right? We're, we're all in clear running now. I, you know, can you speak to the enormity of the size of this problem that we're actually still in? I mean, the fact that the market's green and there's still, and I just looked it up as, as of July 24th, there's still 30 million people in this country that are unemployed. 30 yeah, million. Okay. Well, I'm a market guy, right? So I look at markets in terms of long-term perspectives. I look at Capitulation. I look at I look at uh, uh, price action. You know when it comes to smart money moves. And um, when we saw oil go negative that one day, uh, that looked like to me a capitulation move. So, in, in, in from a market perspective, we've had commodity prices declining since 2008, about the same time that we've had a, no, a lot of money printing coming into the uh, market. I mean, the Federal Reserve, you know, printing trillions of dollars over the last 10 or 15, you know, 10 years or so. And so when you look at all these markets, you have to understand that we've already been in a deflationary environment for a very long time in commodities, especially. The only reason we haven't felt it that much um, and the is because the Federal Reserve has been trying to inflate the economy for the last 10 years, but they've been really falling short of their targets. Their targets are anywhere from two to 3%. They, they kind of cut it back. They started talking about 3% and they said, well, we ain't going to make that. So we cut it back to 2%. <laughs> and, and so you've got a little bit of inflation, but you've had this deflationary uh, undercurrent in the markets for the last 10 years. Well, when this, when this health issue hit, the deflation that we've seen over the last 10 years finally hit bottom. And that's what the oil uh, decline into negative territory kind of said to me. That was the end. Okay. I still believe that the market, the stock market was going to probably go to a new low at that point. However, there was a Federal Reserve meeting shortly after that bottom in the stock market and the oil market in which Alan Greens or not Alan Greenspan, dating myself here, Jerome Powell said, we will do whatever is necessary. And so about a month ago on your show, I said, hey, the 1932, 1933 playbook for the severe decline in the stock market is probably off the table because of that. Once he said that they'll do whatever they can and whatever they have available to them and use every tool in their toolbox in order to inflate the economy, uh, that they will do it. That's exactly what's happening. So we saw a dramatic drop over the last couple of weeks of the U.S. dollar index. Hmm. And so I the U.S. dollar index has been declining very, very sharply. We saw capitulation in commodity prices. We saw, and that, that means that the de deflationary, to me, as a market guy, that means the deflationary scenario that occurred between 1929 and 1932 is probably off the table because they will print, they don't care how much they print. They could print 
you know, they're up, they're up to seven or nine trillion dollars right now on their balance sheets. They'll go to 11, they'll go to 20, they'll go to 30, they'll go to 40, they'll go to 50, they'll go to 100 trillion. They don't care. They do not care anymore. They are not going to let deflation happen. And so, in fact, in fact, just uh, uh, last Wednesday, the FOMC meeting, again, Jerome Powell came out with a statement saying that we are now ready to inflate the economy. They are going to inflate the economy, which means that there is no limit to how much they're going to print. They are not going to let asset prices fall. Well, okay, so I want to jump in here and tell you guys that to reinforce the point and the conversation that Dave and I are having here, and my apologies that we had to hold this back. We recorded this on Friday, and I had to release it today so we could get you guys to Miguel I- Miguel Viez interview. And again, thank you to him for that great conversation. But I want to uh, tell you that I was fortunate enough to have a quick conversation with Blake Skadron yesterday from uh, I Trust Capital, and let me tell you something. Blake really drove it home here, and I'm going to let you see this quick, very quick example, and we're going to jump right back into the show with Dave, but this is such a perfect example to go align with exactly what Dave's point was here, talking about they, they are not going to let deflation happen, right? They're, they're going to print and print and print and print, and here, watch what happens when that happens. This is one of the best demonstrations I've ever seen. Blake Skadron from iTrust Capital. All right, so we're here with Blake Skadron from iTrust Capital. I just wanted to jump out of the conversation with Dave Kryptopoulos, our co-host on Friday's show. We were just talking about $7 trillion plus printed by the Fed. And I, I'm a visual person, Blake. I'm a visual person. You have like probably the best visual example of how to understand the difference between gold and dollars and what the implications are when the Fed prints, 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 prints. Tell us what you got, Blake. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Brad, again. And uh, the last time we did a little visual with that $100 trillion Zimbabwe note, uh, I know that uh, resonated with a lot of people and and it helped them understand. So we're going to do a new exercise today to understand uh, the price of gold over the last about 150 years in the United States. So again, I have my my one ounce of gold. Now this is not from uh, the old days. This is a modern gold eagle, one ounce. Um, so in the late 1800s, all the way through 1933 in the United States, if you had one ounce of gold, it equaled this, $20. It didn't change. That's what the gold standard was all about. This was back with this. So this value remained the same. Now in 1933, uh, Great Depression era, um, Roosevelt needed to, and the Federal Reserve Bank needed to devalue the dollar. But you can't devalue the dollar when it's backed by this. So what did they do? They recalled gold. Everybody had to turn in their gold uh, coins and, and because it was real money at the time, not like it is today. So in 33, everybody turned in their gold. But don't worry, it wasn't just taken for nothing. The government gave them one of these for one of these. Well, it sounded fair enough, right? However, shortly thereafter, um, they revalued this after they took it from the citizens to equal this, which is $35. So it doesn't sound like a lot, but it actually devalued uh, everyone's dollars by 75%. Therefore, inflation, uh, very similar to a quantitative easing that we see today. This was a way to um, expand the money supply and to inflate through debt in that era. Now, the $35 level for gold remained until 1971 when Nixon took took us off the gold standard um, and threw everything uh, to the wind. And obviously now today, this, this hasn't changed throughout this whole time. It's the same one ounce, it's just the same gold And today it takes, we were just talking about the price a minute ago, right? It takes $2,050 to get one of these. Well, what's changed? This hasn't changed. It's how many of these it takes to get one of these. And, you know, we're we're breaking all time highs in gold. I know you mentioned the $7 trillion that we've already, uh, money expansion. 
2020 will be the first year since World War II uh, that the uh, debt will surpass GDP in this country. And are we any better off? Are things getting better? So the question is, is the Fed going to keep printing or retracting? And what will this be worth in 30 days or 90 days or a year or five years based on what we know about uh, gold versus the dollar over the long term? Blake from I Trust Capital. I want to remind everybody, if you're interested in an IRA, this is the guy to go see right here. They've got gold IRAs. they got crypto IRAs. Reach out to them. And go see what they have for products that are offering. And in a time right now when people are really devastated and losing jobs all over the place, this is a very real conversation for a lot of people. Check out Blake from I uh, Trust Capital. Blake, thank you so much for stopping by. My pleasure. It's always uh, thanks for having me, Brad. You got it. Take care, my friend. There we go. And All shout right, out so we're- to uh, Blake from I Trust Capital for stopping by on that clip. I mean, I think it really sends home the conversation. Now let's jump right back in. Let me get us queued up here and get right back into where we left off in the conversation here at 25 minutes and 23 seconds. Enjoy the rest of the show, guys. That's the price is fall. Well, Funny you should bring that up. If you refresh my profile, I just retweeted a post that I shared a few days ago. Um, and it is from, uh, is it Dave Amphidato? Uh What is his uh, Oh, my gosh. Oh, uh, 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 yeah. Uh, and, and Delfato. And Delfato. From the, yes, exactly. Economist and was at the Fed for a while. He's not still there now. But um he puts up velocity of money chart here, right? Ah, we, we've looked at that many times, yes. And this is interesting because what you just talked about is really, uh, you know, for those who think the trouble is over, well, this graph shows me it is far from over. Because oh, very far, yeah. The, the money has been going straight over to buy all the bonds up and all the corporate bonds and all of these things to, to give that stock market to look its God of a few hundred points positive. And it's not getting to the people. There's no cycle of money moving in a natural manner. There's a false economy being showcased and paraded on the markets right now. And the velocity of money falling like a manhole cover from the sky is illustrating that at some point, this is going to come home to roost. Because if you don't have velocity of money, it could be $100 trillion you print. It doesn't matter. $100 trillion times zero or $7 trillion times zero, as Jim Rickard said, is zero. That's absolutely correct. You know, uh, uh, Dan at Tradingology and I in, in his uh, trading room have gone over this uh, just about every week. And uh, we were waiting for this update. Uh, this shows, and we knew it was going to happen, was the velocity of money was going to decline sharply, obviously, because they've shut down the economy, right? Yeah. And not only that, but there's a shortage of coins because businesses are not open, so they can't. In fact, Jerome Powell actually said that at the last FOMC meeting last Wednesday saying, hey, look, this is the reason why there's no there's a coin shortage. Businesses aren't open. They're not taking cash. They're not taking coins. They're not, if, if the small business, especially restaurants, are not, you know, getting that change. They're not, people are going to the restaurant or a coffee shop or whatever, and they're not leaving their change on the counter anymore. So there's not, there is no, there is no money floating around anymore, at least not in the, uh, in, in the current, in currency. And so, you have, you have this very sharp decline. Now, also, you want to notice on this chart, it's very subtle. But if you look really, really closely, there's a gray line going down the right side of that chart. Okay. You see that? I that, am... mean, that means officially we're in a recession. So the, uh, the Federal Reserve recognizes the fact that we are in a recession. Uh, I wonder if they paint it a different color when we're in a depression. <laughs> I don't see one there, but I see a lot of gray lines. Where wherever there's a gray stripe there, yeah, uh, a vertical gray stripe, that is a recession period, and you can see that they just painted that on the right side of the chart as the as the money supply declined. Wow, uh, you know, would it turn red? I wonder. Yeah, it's interesting. I tell you, you know, it's like I, when I see this, and I think about you know the problem that that really is not really being talked about or addressed is this 
you know, yeah. and it really highlights what they're doing and the fact that this house of cards is going to come down. It's going to come down the big way and it becomes a currency issue when it comes down. Right. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's, oh, here's, here's a couple of things that um, everybody should be aware of. And that is that lack of money supply, lack of economic activity are, are, are the same thing. So no, no economic activity. Right. When we start to see this move up, we'll probably also see interest rates start to move, move up. up. When we see interest rates start to move up, the Fed is going to print even more because they do not want interest rates to go up. Because what will happen is uh, it means that bond prices are declining. Mm -hmm. So the uh, you know bond prices are inverse to rate rates. When when interest rates go up, the holdings that they have are bonds are. are in the trillions, right? You know, and so they do not want bond prices to go up or to go, to go down rather go down. because they're holding so much of it. And so there's going to be kind of a, a there's going to be a war between you know what the Fed wants and the and the ability to print money and the and the and interest rate environment and everything else. And he's uh, Jerome Powell has also said that, that he he is not intending on raising interest rates for at least three to four years, maybe longer for the foreseeable future. They need to keep rates down. They don't want to push rates up against themselves or they're going to lose money and they are a profit making institution. So wow. they will do whatever they can in order to keep those rates low. Now, I'm sure that once we get out of this health situation, we're going to start to see that velocity of money maybe tick up a little, a little bit. bit. Uh, but uh, they're going to keep a very, very close eye on this. And also, remember, uh, part of this is that uh, U.S. households now are under inc an incredible strain. Mm -hmm. And you probably know many people, uh, yourself and everybody else in the audience, know people. Maybe they haven't said so, but they're defaulting on their credit card debts. Yeah, They're not making their mortgage payments. They're not making the rent payments. They There's a uh, the new... Uh, uh, CARES Act uh, that's, that's you know still being worked on in Congress has an anti-eviction uh, clause in it. So if you're renting and you didn't pay your rent, you can't get evicted. Uh, there is re there is a there is a large number of people who are already homeless. Mm -hmm. They've gotten become become more and more homeless. Um, you, here's uh, the economy is going to look completely different in a year or two from now, and it what as it was last year because probably a good 20 to 30% of the population will have their credit ruined. And so, you know, maybe the only ability that they're going to have to borrow is owning something that, you know, having actual assets like cryptocurrencies or real estate. And so uh, it's going to change dramatically. Uh, the thing that scares me the most is the fact that the federal reserve will own the United States. Yeah, exactly. They'll, they'll have all of the assets. Yeah. They have all of the stocks. They'll have all of the bond, it, uh, corporate bonds. They're going to have all of the digital assets and cryptocurrencies. They're going to have commodities. Um, and you know what? We're all going to be, instead of, you know, it's, and, and it's funny, it's because the Federal Reserve will own all of the U.S. debt, which means that the Federal Reserve will basically own the United States and, and, and we're going to be servicing the Fed exactly. for the next hundred years on that debt. That's it's a scary it's a scary, scary notion. It's it's very strange. And and I have to say, you know, you know, with with that, that is quite a statement. And when you think of that, you know, there was something we talked about before. It was uh, Robert C. Hockett put out a paper about the Treasury potentially introducing a new dollar. And, you know, back then, I remember you had made a comment that, that we were just, you know, speculating on the idea of that. And you had said something that was really, it hit me, and it never left. And it was, you know, maybe they're designing the Fed to just be this bloated thing to hold all the debt. And maybe they do introduce a new dollar that is like the federal dollar spends the same and the whole bit, but to really kind of, you know, almost disengage the Fed other than it holding the debt. I mean, 
almost like cutting the umbilical cord on it. Like, good, that's full of debt. That's where that sits now. We'll let you know, you know, and and the treasury running in a more controlled manner. I don't know. I mean, it's like we are, I think, in uncharted territory. I mean, like you said, the 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 playbook for 1929, 1933, if that's out the window, Dave, where the hell are we at? Oh, we're we're there's going to be uh I, we everybody complains about the income gap right in the United States, you know, you know, you know, there's poor people, is the middle class is being really kind of either pushed down to um, a lower income brackets in the, in the upper classes in the, in the higher income brackets are being, you know, rewarded because they have lots of assets. They have real estate, they have stocks, they have bonds, and now they're getting into cryptocurrencies. Uh, in, in, in there's, it, it really is going to be a division between those who have real assets and those who have debt. So, you know, if you're on, if you're on the debt side, if you're getting debt, if you are in debt, if you, the only way you can get money is debt, uh, it's going to be very hard for you to function in this new economic model, this new paradigm, this shift to uh, blockchain in the digital world. Uh, because if you don't have those assets on one side of, the, of your ledger, uh, your personal, uh, you know, uh, ledger, uh, you're going to have a tough time in this new economy and we're going to see a, a wider separation of the income gap. I think mm. uh, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be a very strange, a little bit dystopian. It'll come on us slowly. And in, in 10 years from now, we're going to wake up and we're going to say, Hey, you know, there are people who are excluded from the system more. So, I mean, there's how many, I, I can't remember the number, maybe, you know, off the top of your head, the number of people who are unbanked in the United States. I can't it's remember. A it's a lot. It's a lot though. I, it was higher than I thought it would. Yeah, it was when I saw the number. And so I think that is going to grow tremendously unless they can, they can start to accumulate, um, you know, some sort of asset. You know, to your point, the interesting thing here is, you know, all of us in the crypto space excited, like institutions are going to be coming into crypto. This is exciting. Next week, Barry Silver, they're going to be running ads on TV. It and also you know, we're a small minority. We right? are. We really are. But it signals much bigger implications. It yeah, isn't just be, yeah, yeah, that's absolutely. right, right? You know, this is not just because of the opportunity that's there. It's because of the opportunity that isn't there anymore on the other side in the traditional markets. And it's all the negative things that we're talking about. And they're like, finally, we see land. You know, we got somewhere to park the money for our hedge funds. And even if it's, look, we all know it's probably going to be a 1% to 3% allocation into crypto for these large institutions. They're not, you know, the toe's coming in, but their toe has got about a trillion or more money probably coming into this market, right? So that's amazing for us and what's going to happen, but it's because they're seeking refuge from a failed economy where they're at right now. Yeah, well, MIT, Stanford, Harvard, Yale, they're all, all of their endowments are invested in, in, in getting into cryptocurrencies at this point. Yeah, I saw a, uh, a really good article recently that, that uh, financial advisors to those institutions are recommending anywhere from one to 6%. One to 6%. Now, if, they, if they hit 1% on those endowments, <laughs> so massive. I mean, the endowments at Harvard and Yale yeah. and Stanford and MIT is gigantic. Yeah, it's massive. I mean, I can only imagine, you know, just that what this market looks like. You know, one of the things is, you know, to go along with all of this good news, the institutions getting ready to prepare to, to enter this market in a very big way, um, is that we're seeing companies like Coinbase, Palantir, and even Ripple have suggested they're going to IPO soon. And then Ant Financial has even said they're going to IPO, looking to do a big IPO at, I think it was in Hong Kong and another exchange there. And Singapore, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, it's massive. It, it's the birth of the dot-com era of crypto, right? I mean, this is really what we're seeing happen. It's like the money's coming in and it's coming in a big way. But the difference for me is, is like, and, and maybe you could help on this too. 
was was the dot com about coming out of a crisis at the same time that we are like now? I mean, I don't remember it being quite as bad as what we're in now. No, in the 1990s, early 1990s, the market had really already kind of start, started to take off. The economy start, started to recover since about 1982. We were in a mild recession from the uh, 70s into, into uh, about 1982. And then that's when Greenspan, that's why he's always in my head, <laughs> right? You know, came out and, and signaled the bond desk that they were going to go in and buy securities or buy uh, you know, uh, treasuries. And so when he signaled that to the bond market, um, the stock market immediately started to take off. And that was kind of the beginning. So we were, we hit 1987, which was a big downturn in the market, but it was immediately bought up. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me, because uh, Greenspan said, hey, look, we're going to support the markets. We're going to continue to do that. And the market continued to go higher. So by 1980, 1995, really when part of MCI, uh, bought the uh, part of, of some of the pipes from DARPA, who really controlled the uh, internetworking of computers at that time and made e-commerce possible. Mm -hmm. At that point, the economy was doing pretty well, so we weren't really in a crisis of any kind. Okay. And so, you know, but a lot of people saw this as kind of a fad. They saw the internet as something that just wasn't going to last. You know, who's going to sit in front of their computer and compete? Why would I send an email to anyone when I can just write a letter to them and put it in the mailbox? It's much easier, you know? Nobody wanted to, I mean, everybody thought it was like, oh, well, it's good for, um, uh, I can't remember. I mean, it was like good for like chatting or kids who wanted to use it just to, you know, to, to look at porno online or something. something you know? Yeah. You yeah. Know? It was just, it, it was, it was a fad that really wasn't going to last. But by, by, by 1997, 1998, after a couple of years, people started taking it seriously. And they said, you know what? It's just another way for us to advertise our business. Mm -hmm. And so we had a lot of companies that have been established for a long time saying, Hey, look, we better set up a website. We better do this. We better do that in order to, you know, grab the domain names that were kind of in limited supply at that point. Uh, there was only so many domain names available in the system. Wow. And so they had to grab those uh, in order to secure their brands. And so, you know, um, and, that, and we had a lot of competition when it came to search engines. We had Alta Vista. We had uh, uh, Google wasn't even around then. We had Yahoo and Alta Vista were the top ones. And then finally Google came along and, you know, that competition wiped out uh, Yahoo and AOL. AOL was huge, you know. Oh, it was huge. Um, and so, but by 1999, the game was over, you know. So just in a few years, everybody was, you know, all the domain, good domain names were gone, all the single letters, all the brand names. And then, of course, they came out after the fact and Congress passed the anti-squatting law for domain names. So if you had registered a domain name with a brand name, a registered trademark, you had to give it up to Ooh. that company. And so, yeah, that was kind of devastating because a lot of people had some valuable names. Um, and so, you know, the legislation didn't come in for like four five, six, seven years after all of this had taken a place. And by 2000, it was pretty well, it was getting mainstream enough that you could set up an e-commerce business. You could start, you know, transacting on the internet. I got in in 1996. I had my very first website in 1996. I was creating websites for other companies, local companies at that time. And I remember, I don't know if I remember if I told you the story or not, but I had gone to this local company. <clears throat> it, the company had been around for about 50 years. And the father who started it was an elderly gentleman. He's probably my age now, <laughs> you know, back, back then. And his son, whose son was in the, like in his early 30s. And I sat there and I told him the internet was going to be bigger than anything you've seen before. This is the biggest technology breakthrough uh, of the century. And bigger than radio, bigger than television, bigger than all that stuff. And the old man looked at me, the, the founder of the company, he said, you don't know what you're talking about. And he got up and walked out. And I said, okay, meeting's over. I knew what I was talking about and I walked out. The next morning, the son calls me. 
he said, you're right. It is. Can you build us a website? Wow. <laughs> so, so I, you know, if you open your eyes, you know, what's kind of going on. I know that there is probably, and maybe there, you're, uh, there's people who are watching us right now in my age bracket, which is, I won't mention it, but it's over 60. And, um, they're watching it and they're saying, look, I don't know anything about cryptocurrency. It sounds too complicated to me. And I'm going to tell them, you know, if you really, if you want to have a fairly decent retirement over the next few years, you need to learn something about this space. You need to get a handle on it. You need to kind of take those complex uh, subject matters and kind of boil it down into something that you can understand that you can really kind of wrap your mind around because it's just like the internet in the early days and you were there for the internet in the early days. It's going to be probably, this is in fin in the financial world, in the business world, this is the biggest breakthrough. Blockchain and DLT is the biggest breakthrough that you're going to see in your lifetime. It's even going to be even bigger than the, the internet was at the start in 1995. I mean, the internet was actually around in the 1950s when DARPA created internet working of computers, but it didn't really become mainstream was like email and stuff like that. Well, this is good. And this is the same way. Technology is complex, but the rewards for early people who get into the space, and it's still early in my opinion, but I think it's getting, it's getting to the point now where it, we're starting to see that curve, right, of adoption start to head this way. Yeah. And when we hit that, when we hit that curve and we start to go up like this, there's going to be no stopping it. It is the biggest financial um, paradigm shift in, in my lifetime. And I think probably hundreds of years. I mean, you think about digital assets as a new asset class. It's the first new asset class since like 1600s when, bot, when governments issued bonds for the first time. It's, rem and so yeah, it's remarkable. Am, that's why I am super excited to you know, tell everybody that you've come out of, with a course that is launched today that is would if you have any questions about cryptocurrencies you're going to answer those questions you're going to provide the clarity for people just getting into this space or even if you've been in the space for a little while but you haven't put all the pieces together yet uh why don't, why don't you talk about that brad because uh, i'm super excited about it thank you dave yeah and i am excited about it and it was a nice segue i didn't even know we were going to bring it up today but that i am very excited about it and thank you and it, it is you what you said is accurate it's like you know we are on the precipice of some really incredible uh things happening and it is the greatest financial paradigm shift and 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 if you are in this space and hearing this at all, this is a really affordable course for one thing. It is an introductory offer. It is very, very inexpensive to take. And it is designed that way to get you educated. And what we talk about in here, one is I do a video that basically just gets you to look at your journey of your life for a second and take a few minutes and kind of reset your perspective before you get into the courses. And then we talk about exactly what cryptocurrency is as in general and get you that knowledge and that understanding and get your mind wrapped around that. And then we move into what is Bitcoin, right? What is mining? What is proof of work? What is forks? You know, what is Ethereum? What is proof of stake? You know, what's up with the foundation for Ethereum? What is, you know, Ethereum 2.0? Then we'd go into Ripple, of course, and we talk about Ripple as well. And then there's even a little video I did with you, Dave, which is amazing. And it's about private keys. And I just thought, you know, you had the idea for me to pursue that and to put that together. And it was such a good idea because I'm going to tell you, when I went down into that, I was like, you know, there's a few things I need to understand here. And it, it's just I'm glad that we're doing it. I'm glad that it's here and available. There is a description, a link in the description box, and it will be in the comment section. And I'm telling you guys, get on the Rich List newsletter for this, uh, for the email and the newsletter. Get yourself signed up for that. There's going to be this and so many other things out there that if you don't necessarily need it, you're going to have a friend or family member because as this market moves, and we just heard Barry Silbert call to action next week the ads go on to regular television 
It's not going backwards from here, right? So, you know, if you're flooded with people asking you, how do you get into this space? I, I think back to 2017 and what it was like being in the space and the exchange is freezing up because so many people were trying to oh, sign yeah. up on accounts, right? People yeah. were blowing my phone up. Hey, man, how do you get in there? This thing's going crazy. And it's like now with the channel and all those things, I can't. I can't, you know, I can't sit one on one with everybody and just help them in that immediate moment. It's not possible. So that was another reason for putting these courses together, too. So, you know, I encourage everybody, if you even if you've been in this space a bit and you're missing like a piece or two, this course is so affordable that you should take it and just fill in that missing piece or two that you have so your foundation about crypto and what's happening here is really strong going forward yeah yeah absolutely i i recommend it for everybody i think that you know you need to round out your knowledge because like i said we are really on that trajectory right now where we had those early adopters and then we've had this long period of like flat adoption right and now that the OCC has come out and said, hey, look, we've got our customers want to protect their valuable assets and banks can now custody crypto. And they mentioned that cryptocurrencies are one of the most valuable assets. Mm -hmm. and, and so that I can see that you know, trajectory just going up that early adoption curve into mass adoption. And once that starts, it's not going to stop. It's not going to stop. It's, it's going to keep stop. going just like the Internet has always has, has had exponential growth since, uh, you know, 1995 and, and it, the blockchain is going to be even bigger than that. So, you know, getting knowledge, knowledge really is power. And when we did that, when we did that segment uh, in the course on private keys and I shared with you my story, that alone is worth the price of the course because it is so important to understand exactly what private keys are, how to use them if you get in trouble, how to, what to, you know, what, what, what do you do when you can't access your crypto? Exactly. That was really, really, I think, uh, you know, it was just fun to do. And it was a pretty uh, relevant story because it just happened to me recently. It was a very relevant story, and it is something that, you know, all, it's so funny because in this space you'll hear such cliche lines, but they don't give you an answer. Not your keys, not your crypto. Yeah, what does oh, that mean? Yeah, what does that mean, and what the hell's the answer then? You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. and that's that's what's key about this course. So, yeah, really, really uh, looking forward to people checking that course out. One more thing before we wrap. Um, this just really pushes home Barry Silbert's, you know, flag on the moon call to action about what they're about to do here with mass media advertising. SEC shares names of 20 institutional crypto investors that are filing uh, reports with the United States Securities Exchange Commission, according to the documents they have invested in Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. So this all goes in support of Barry and what he's doing. And the names go from Rothschilds to Boston Private Wealth, Rothschilds Investment Corps, uh, you know, BCJ Capital. I'm just going through a few of these because, you know, there's Sterling Investment, uh, Veris Capital Partners, Edge Wealth. Uh, it, it's just, you know, and we're talking about, you know, these ARC Investment Management LLC assets under management by the firm are $4.4 billion. You know, these aren't corner stores, you know. You know, they're yeah. coming in. No, they're coming in. I already see that. I like I said, I see the footprints of smart money coming into this market. It's pretty clear to me. And yeah. um, you know, I mean, I guess if I was to leave with any one kind of, you know, you know, urging or you know, uh, some sort of message for everybody who's listening to this, is that once in a generation, you're lucky if you get a huge opportunity. This is an opportunity for multi-generations. I mean, I don't think there's been an opportunity like this, even, even with the internet. This is gonna dwarf the internet mm -hmm. uh, because of the scope in which you're gonna see blockchain technology uh, adopted in just about everything, including legal, supply chain management, finance, I mean, the number of industries that this is going to touch and change forever is going to be massive. 
um, and it's worldwide. So, you know, it's going to be a big deal. I think if, you know, if, if I was to urge anyone, I'm not saying that you need to go out and invest right away or you need to, you know, do anything crazy and don't borrow money to invest. That's for sure. But Hey, look, if you can allocate a couple bucks a week just to get into something, because I can see asset prices in the cryptocurrency market exceeding the 2017 highs. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people know that the 2017 highs, I mean, some like Ripple uh, in 2017, it went up 35,000% in a year. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the opportunities are real. You don't have to go overboard, but you should have some. I mean, I just, I, I mean, I, it's not a recommendation or I'm not a financial advisor or anything like that. I'm just a guy that's been around for 40 years in the markets and I can see what's coming. Yeah, no, well said. Well said. Yeah, uh, my final thought is it is really in line with exactly what you're saying. And for people to, you know, it, look, I know sometimes following the news and following the economy can, you know, not be fun for people in those things, but you can't, you know, nobody's going to give you a pass for having your head in the sand. You got to, you got to, you got to get your awareness, you know, together and, and you need to broaden it, even if it's just a little bit. And I think you're going to find for yourself while you're looking at the people are looking at these things, they're going to find for themselves that this is something I could be in and it, and it, and it doesn't mean I have to have a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars or what have you, you know, but it's something I can begin doing and nothing pleases me more than that, than that we get to send that message right here from this show out to people, the single mom with one or two kids, right? The, the, whoever that is, I mean, these are the people I want to reach, you know, the, the wealthy people, Barry Silver to talk to them. He knows how to get a hold of them. I'm trying yeah. to talk to the people that are out here like you and me that, you know, they work hard. They work for everything they have and not, not suggesting that the people who are wealthy didn't work for what they have. That's a misnomer too. But I want to reach the people who have an opportunity to either impact or change their life. And I'm not a financial advisor either, but the writing is on the wall. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you hundred percent. Well said. Uh, and also we're not, we're not telling you, Hey, you go out and just buy this one, this one or that one. Right. You guys know what we like, but you go out and buy whatever you want. That's right. As long as you have something, you know, just have an asset there that you can, you know, I mean, I think the whole market's going to go up as a whole. Uh, try to stay away from the scam coins. There are scam coins out there just as a warning. Yeah. Uh, so you want to stay with some proven projects that have been around for a while that have a good team and, you, you know, that stand behind their projects. So, you want to kind of be careful and do your due diligence, but at the same time, you know, uh, this is the time. It you really, know, is. it really is. Dave, thank you so much for being here, my friend. It's been oh, such a pleasure. pleasure. And I tell you what, working on this course has been just a blast. I've learned so much and I want to let everybody know if they haven't checked out the copycat course, the copycat millionaire course, they need to check that out. Tell them about that real quick before we go. Yeah. So I'll, uh, a lot of what I've done in publishing since 2000, I started my publishing company in 2000 on the internet. Uh, I was one of the first publishers to create e an ebook in PDF format and sell it. And since then, I've created dozens of courses, hundreds of different uh, digital project products over the years, and it's earned me many millions of dollars. So it's, it's something I know very, very well. And I put up a lot of what I know about creating courses into a course, and that's also available uh, at the learn.infoproductlab.com uh, website. Absolutely. All right, Dave, have a great weekend. Thank you so much, my friend, and we'll talk soon. You too. All right, Bye, take everybody. care.